Welcome to a crash course in pediatrics. My name is Dr. Shahid. I'm a general pediatrician and medical educator. CRASH stands for Clinical Reasoning and Analytical Skills with Shahid. The goal of this course is to teach clinical reasoning skills to medical students and residents. This is a series of lectures that will take you through several pediatric cases where you will learn how to critically think through a patient case and come up with a broad differential diagnosis. These cases are intended for educational purposes only and are not intended for actual patient care. The objectives of the crash course are listed here. So let's start our case. In this case, we have an 18-month-old female presenting with fever and rash. Per mom, the patient started having fever two days ago, up to 101.8. She has not been active as usual and has been lying around for the past several days, wanting to be carried everywhere. She has had a decreased appetite over the past one week. Yesterday, mom noticed a rash, mainly on her trunk. The rash does not seem to bother the patient. She does not scratch at it. It seems to be getting worse since yesterday and is now spreading to her extremities. Past medical history, she had pink eye about two weeks ago and then developed an ear infection for which she is currently on day 10 of amoxicillin. She's not been hospitalized before or had any surgeries. She does have a hemangioma on her back. She also has a history of eczema. No known drug allergies, immunizations are up to date, and she's on her last day of amoxicillin. She lives at home with her parents and a four-year-old brother, and she attends daycare. Mom does have a history of lupus. The entire family had upper respiratory infections about two weeks ago. All of them are doing well now. Travel history, the family went to North Carolina last weekend to visit grandparents. On review of symptoms, Mom feels patient has been a little clumsy the past one to two weeks. She has bumped into things and stumbled several times. Physical exam, temperature is 38.7, heart rate is 124, respiratory rate of 28, blood pressure of 112 over 76. Height and weight are in the 25th percentile. In general, the patient is mildly ill-appearing, no respiratory distress, she is sitting quietly in mother's lap and begins to cry as you approach her. On skin exam, she has small 1 to 2 millimeter non-blanching reddish brown flat lesions scattered diffusely on her extremities, trunk, and neck, as well as a few on her face. She has a 3 centimeter by 3 centimeter hemangioma on her back. HENT, she is crying. The sclera are mildly injected. The conjunctiva appear mildly pale. Pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. Extraocular muscles are intact, but she has occasional erratic eye movements. The right tympanic membrane is normal. The left tympanic membrane is dull, but no erythema. The throat has no erythema. Neck exam, she has few 1 cm cervical nodes bilaterally. Lungs are clear. Cardiac is normal, with a grade 2 out of 6 systolic ejection murmur at the left lower sternal border. Abdomen, patient is crying, so it is difficult to examine, but it appears to be soft. No masses or hepatosplenomegaly. No gross guarding or rebound. Extremities, there is no clubbing or cyanosis. The rash is noted as above. There is no swelling, erythema, or warmth of the joints. Neuro, deep tendon reflexes are 2+. plus. She is refusing to stand or walk, but appears to have good tone. To summarize our problem list, we have an 18-month-old female coming in with a petechial rash and fever. She has decreased activity and decreased appetite. She is refusing to stand and refusing to walk. She has a history of pink eye and a recent otitis media for which she is finishing her amoxicillin. There is a recent travel history to North Carolina. She has been clumsy for the past two weeks. On exam, she has a fever, an increased heart rate, and increased blood pressure. She has occasional erratic eye movements. She has pale conjunctiva and injected sclera. She has bilateral small cervical lymph nodes. She has a murmur on exam, a hemangioma on her back, and a dull left tympanic membrane. So in this patient, we have an 18-month-old female coming in with a petechial rash and fever. 
So let's go through the differential diagnosis of an 18-month-old with petechial rash and fever. And let's start with the first category, um, and we'll, call, we'll talk about infections first, causing different type of petechial rashes and fevers. So under infection, you can think about viral causes, and you can think about bacterial causes. So let's talk about viral causes. And under viral causes, there can be specific viruses that can give you a petechial rash with fever, and then there's kind of non-specific causes of uh, petechial rash and fever. So under non-specific, um, we can say things like um, enterovirus um, is a uh, very common cause of uh, petechial rash and fever. So uh, a non-specific cause um, uh, could be uh, enterovirus. That actually is quite a common cause of uh, petechial rash and fever in children, different type of enteroviruses. Um, and then adenovirus is another common one that can uh, do it as well. Um, so these are kind of non-specific, if you will, just kind of uh, families and categories of uh, different types of, uh, of non-specific viruses, um, enterovirus and adenovirus, causing you to have a petechial rash with fever. Uh, other viral um, infections can be more specific viruses. Um, so some of the specific ones uh, can include um, uh, EBV, is a, is a common one. Another one is CMV. Um, and then a third one is parvovirus. So these three viruses, I kind of think of uh, together um, where they can cause uh, petechial rash and fever and they can cause uh, similar findings, different rashes, different uh, bone marrow changes. Um, so EBV, CMV, parvovirus, I, I kind of lump them together um, because they can have a lot of similar uh, clinical manifestations then. Um, so these would be some specific viral, viral infection that can give you a petechial rash and fever. Um, and a couple other ones uh, that you might consider uh, include uh, HIV, um, uh, can do that as well. Um, and another one would be HSV, um, herpes simplex virus, simplex virus, because that can also give you uh, a petechial rash and fever, especially if you have eczema, right? It gives you something called eczema uh, herpeticum when you have uh, a herpetic infection uh, over an area of eczema. So these are some specific viruses that can give you a uh, uh, tika rash and, and fever. So now let's talk about different bacterial causes. Um, so that was viral. Um, so now let's talk about bacterial causes of uh, tika rash and fever. And in this category, um, so let's say infection. Um, so under this category, um, there's a very important uh, a couple of uh, antibiotics that you really have to, uh, to think about. Uh, the first one is a very common type of uh, bacterial infection um, that can actually give you petechial rash and uh, fever. Um, and that's basically uh, um, group A strep uh, type of infections can give you petechial rash and fever. Um, and there's a specific area that can, uh, um, group A strep can give you a petechial rash. And that could be in the antecubital fossa or the uh, popliteal fossa um, and gives you more petechiae. And then that's actually called posteas lines when you have uh, um, these type of uh, petechial rash uh, associated with strep in the antecubital fossa or the popliteal fossa. So that's something to consider um, is group A strep and posteas lines. And occasionally, a scarlatiniform type of rash might look petechial, but it's usually more maculopapular, uh, but we can still maybe uh, put that in there just as a, as a thought then, right? Scarlatinif scarlatiniform uh, type of rash. So the uh, um, scarlet fever type of rash of uh, group A strep occasionally can be petechial, um, but again, if it is, it's usually in the antecubital fossa um, and looks uh, more petechial, and then that would be more uh, called the posteal lines. Uh, okay, other bacterial infections that you have to think about. Uh, now, uh, group A strep is common, it's usually not that uh, severe or significant, but the other entities and the other bacterial infections to think about are ones that cause really bad uh, infections and sepsis. Um, and the uh, uh, major consideration on a child coming in with petechial rash and fever is you always have to think about meningococcemia on that patient. Uh, so meningococcemia can be a, uh, um, uh, can present with petechial rash and fever. And I think that's a very major consideration and a very important consideration that you have to have in children coming in with petechial rash and fever. Most likely they have something simple like enterovirus and it's not gonna be anything life-threatening. Um, uh, or like group A strep, but occasionally they can have an intracoxemia and a Neisseria meningitidis infection, sepsis, meningitis, and that can obviously have a, a very uh, bad outcome. And now we do have uh, conjugated vaccines for that, so it's not as, as common, uh, but it's still something to, uh, to consider.
other uh, types of bacterial infections um, to uh, consider. Um, we mentioned meningococcemia, and that can uh, lead to DIC and sepsis. Um, um, but there could be other organisms that can cause GIC and sepsis as well. So uh, pneumococcal infections can do that, so pneumococcal sepsis. Again, we have conjugated pneumococcal vaccine, but there's so many serotypes of pneumococcus that are not covered in the conjugated vaccines that you can still get uh, um, DIC and sepsis from, uh, from pneumococcal type of infection. So, uh, um, so we'll say pneumococcal type of sepsis. Um, so that's always a consideration as well. And then a couple other things, uh, um, especially in this patient, we have a history of travel to North Carolina, um, uh, and there are some endemic infections that you have to think about uh, that can present with particular rash and fever. Um, and one important one is Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever um, is another entity that can present with particular rash and fever. Um, it's endemic on the East Coast in the North Carolina area. So this uh, patient uh, had traveled uh, with, with her family to that area. So that's something to consider. Now, typically, Rocky Mountain, Mount, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever typically will give you uh, uh, the particular rash uh, initially on the extremity, so on the palms and the soles um, and the hands and the feet, and then it will travel uh, more centrally. Uh, usually these type of rashes start more central and go peripheral, but Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever starts more peripheral and then goes central. Um, so always look at the hands and the feet um, that you can uh, look for the petechiae. Now other viruses can do that as well, like enterovirus can give you hand, foot, mouth disease. Um, so uh, that can also give you uh, rashes on your hands and your feet as well. Um, but again, something to, uh, to consider and recognize and try to differentiate uh, something benign like enteroviral uh, infection versus uh, something uh, more ominous like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, then another uh, entity you uh, always consider is uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis. Um, that's always a possibility when you have a uh, uh, particular rash and uh, fever. So just something to keep in mind, maybe not as likely, but something to consider. So the initial category that you have to really worry about for a particular rash and fever uh, differential diagnosis uh, um, are, are the different infections and especially viral infections, more common, um, but uh, not as, uh, as worrisome, but um, still needs to be uh, um, considered. And then the bacterial causes like group A strep, um, and then other more ominous type of infections, I think uh, are very important to, uh, to consider. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, uh, another category after infection. I think another big category to think about in a 18-month-old uh, coming in with, with particular rash and fever. Um, let's call it uh, immuno, uh, immunologic or collagen vascular or rheumatologic. Let's kind of put it into that uh, category. So uh, let's put that here so we can say uh, I'm kind of immune-mediated, um, collagen vascular or uh, rheum. Uh, type of thing. So let's put that uh, um, as our next uh, category of um, things on the differential for a particular rash and fever. So in this group, um, the most common cause of a particular rash, especially in this age group, is going to be at this group, and that's going to be ITP. That by far is going to be the most common cause of particular rash without fever, though. So that's a big distinction, without fever. Um, uh, so ITP, um, you have destruction of your platelets, immune-mediated me, immune post-viral type of destruction of your platelets, so you get thrombocytopenic and you come in with TKI, but usually that child does not have a fever and looks good, does not look ill in any way. Um, so ITP is a very important consideration, but if uh, the child really should be without fever at that point, um, then it's, uh, it's a very important consideration. But if they do have fever, then you have to think about some of these other things, and it's less likely to be ITP if they come in with a fever in addition to the particular rash. Um, other things that uh, you could consider, again, immune-mediated uh, type of stuff um, includes HSP, Hanachshalin and Purpura. Uh, typically, that will present... Uh, uh, with uh, maybe some initial petechiae that kind of coalesce and becomes more purpuric. So it'd be the palpable purpura of HSP, usually on the buttocks and the lower extremity. Um, uh, and that can present uh, with a petechial rash, but then it usually coalesces and becomes more purpuric. Um, and usually here you have normal platelets uh, in HSP compared to like ITP and other entities. Um, the platelets are normal, uh, usually a uh, normal level at this point. And you get other findings like arthritis, single limb arthritis, and other things with, uh, with HSP. Um, another entity to think about in this category uh, could be HUS, hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, so that will give you uh, hemolytic anemia, 
uremia and thrombocytopenia. Um, that's typically after uh, some sort of bacterial gastroenteritis with like E. coli or some other bacterial cause, and then you develop a uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome and you can get petechiae from the thrombocytopenia. In addition to that, you get the hemolytic anemia and the, ure the uremia uh, as well. So that's another consideration. Um, and then uh, you always think about collagen vascular things like uh, lupus and uh, JIA, uh, things like that, because that can cause you to, again, have thrombocytopenia um, as part of the hematologic uh, um, autoimmune-mediated uh, type of responses. There's a family history of lupus uh, in this family, so that's something to, uh, uh, to, to consider as well. Um, so that's always uh, on the differential on a child coming in with uh, particular rash and then if they, especially if they have a fever, um, uh, again, that could be part of an inflammatory uh, type of uh, type of response. And there's other vasculitic type of processes, um, uh, maybe not as common uh, with particular rash, but still to consider um, something like Kawasaki disease can present uh, with different type of rashes, not necessarily particular all the time, but different vasculitic uh, type of processes can still give you a uh, particular rash occasionally, and then the prolonged fever, and the eye findings, and the swelling of the hands and feet, um, so all the different findings that you would see with, uh, uh, with Kawasaki disease, so that's something to consider. Then the last category, we'll call it uh, uh, more immunodeficiency. Um, so under immunodeficiency, um, uh, we talked about HIV as an acquired immunodeficiency. So after HIV, under immunodeficiency, you can think about other congenital types, types of immunodeficiency, uh, HIV being acquired, but then a congenital uh, uh, immunodeficiency. And uh, there's one in particular that you have to think about uh, on a child that's coming in with a particular rash, um, uh, with the implication being that that patient is thrombocytopenic. Um, and uh, our child in this vignette also has eczema, so a child with particular rash from thrombocytopenia with eczema, and if they have recurrent otitis media or recurrent sinopulmonary infections, then you think about an IgM type of deficiency causing that. So a patient that has the triad of IgM deficiency, um, eczema, and thrombocytopenia um, is then the immunodeficiency that we're thinking of here, and that's called Wiskott-Aldrich syndrome. So Wiscott-Aldrich is a uh, uh, immunodeficiency. Um, that uh, has IgM deficiency, um, and then it also has eczema and thrombocytopenia. So that's something to consider on uh, this type of uh, a, a patient uh, uh, coming in with, uh, um, with, these, with these type of uh, findings. Then. Um, so these are some of the immunologic and collagen vascular and rheumatologic things that uh, you'd have to consider um, uh, on, on this uh, type of patient then. Um, and then when we move on to other type of, uh, uh, of causes of particular rash and fever, the next category that we can think about is, uh, is hematologic. Um, so let's think about heme uh, causes of, uh, um, of uh, particular rash and fever. So that's something that uh, should also be in the, um, in the differential. Um, and we already mentioned ITP um, uh, over here. So uh, that could be also hematologic uh, as well. So you have a, a low platelets um, and causing the particular rash and usually again it's without fever. Then there's another entity called Evans syndrome. Um, and Evans syndrome is a uh, another uh, immune mediated uh, type of process that's causing destruction of uh, not only your platelets, which you get in ITP, but also of your red cells. So Evans syndrome is, uh, is a um, hemolytic process that destroys your red cells um, and also destruction of your platelets. So it's an immune mediated uh, type of process um, where ITP only um, involves your platelets, but Evans syndrome involves your red cells and your platelets. And some people believe that Evans syndrome is kind of on the spectrum of lupus um, uh, because you have the hemolytic anemia and the thrombocytopenia, so it, it could be on the spectrum of lupus. Um, but uh, again, Evans syndrome is usually destruction of your red cells and your platelets um, from an immune mediated uh, type of uh, uh, type of response then. Okay, um, and then if we move on to other causes of this, uh, in this child um, that has uh, a larger hemangioma on her back, which she has on her exam, there's one uh, other entity, entity that you have to think about in which you have a large cavernous hemangioma um, that causes a consumption coagulopathy um, and then there's destruction of red cells and platelets um, uh, in that cavernous hemangioma and they could actually present with DIC and other type of, uh, type of findings. Um, so there's one of, there's an entity that uh, I'm thinking about here and it's called uh, kasabach merritt syndrome. kasabach merritt syndrome um, is uh, a, a process where you have 
a um, cavernous hemangioma. Um, and then in that hemangioma, you get trap, you get uh, trapping of red cells and platelets and destruction of the red cells and the platelets um, uh, in that cavernous hemangioma. So they come in with anemia and thrombocytopenia, um, uh, um, and they have this entity called Kassebach Merritt syndrome, which is something to consider in our child as well, um, because she does have a, a, a hemangioma on the back. And it's possible that uh, that's what's causing um, the destruction of her platelets and coming into thrombocytopenia. Uh, thrombocytopenia and the uh, um, uh, and the petechiae then, okay? Uh, another uh, uh, entity um, uh, related to a recent viral infection uh, could be that um, the patient just has an aplastic anemia. Um, so uh, um, a recent viral infection causing bone marrow suppression um, of, uh, of the red cells and maybe even of the, of the platelets and maybe of the white cells. Um, so when you have a petechial rash, you should have to think about uh, low platelets, but it's possible that other cell lines are also involved and not just the platelets. So an aplastic anemia can involve any of the cell lines and many times it involves all the cell lines. Um, and we know for sure uh, um, the association of parvovirus, um, uh, parvo B19, especially in like sickle cell patients, um, where that is a risk factor for developing an aplastic crisis and aplastic anemia. Um, so parvovirus uh, and other viruses can cause uh, an aplastic uh, anemia. So that's something to uh, to to consider as well then. Um, then other uh, hematologic uh, type of things that we can think about. Um, you can think about uh, something called hypersplenism. Um, so basically an overactive uh, spleen that is starting to uh, destroy red cells and uh, particularly platelets in this situation with the petechial rash, hypersplenism, um, and that could be from different viruses. Like I mentioned, the parvovirus, EPV, CMV, uh, all of those are known to give you hepatosplenomegaly um, and hypersplenism and destruction of uh, platelets um, and maybe in red cells. So anything that causes hypersplenism, um, like a viral process uh, can uh, cause you to have thrombocytopenia and, uh, and the fever will be from the concurrent uh, viral infection. And then uh, the last category that we put into, into here um, would be drugs. So different medications can cause you to have bone marrow suppression um, and uh, thrombocytopenia as a result of it. Um, and antibiotics uh, can commonly do that. Um, uh, Bactrim or the sulfa drugs are commonly associated with that. Even amoxicillin, our patient at this vignette has been on amoxicillin uh, for the last 10 days. So it's possible the amoxicillin is causing um, the uh, bone marrow suppression and uh, um, thrombocytopenia and therefore the, the uh, particular rash. Um, and then the, the fever could be from the otitis media that's still there um, or uh, a drug fever. So uh, the fever could go along with that as well. Um, then other medications like anticonvulsants can also cause bone marrow suppression and thrombocytopenia. So there's lots of medications, lots of drugs that can uh, uh, cause this as well. And I think that's important to, uh, to consider uh, um, in this type of a uh, uh, patient as well then. And then when we move on to our, our last category, uh, we could put that over here. Uh, we talked about heme, so now we could talk about uh, uh, oncology and uh, different type of malignancies that uh, can cause you to have a petechia rash and, uh, and a fever. Um, and there's a couple uh, that you have to think about uh, in, this, uh, um, uh, in, this, uh, in this category. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, let's talk about some of the uh, malignancies um, that can uh, present with petechia rash and fever. One of the most common things that uh, you have to think about in oncology causing particular rash and fever uh, would be things like leukemia, right? Um, so ALL um, and other type of leukemias are a major consideration in a child uh, coming in with a particular rash and fever. So leukemia, um, uh, especially uh, like ALL, that's an important consideration. Um, then the next uh, malignancy that can present with particular rash and fever um, is uh, neuroblastoma. Um, because we know neuroblastoma can metastasize to the bone marrow and cause bone marrow suppression. And then uh, children with neuroblastoma uh, can cause, uh, uh, can present with particular rash and uh, fever as well. So that's something to, to consider uh, as well. And then the last uh, one that uh, we can kind of consider here is uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis, um, uh, another malignancy 
um, uh, where you have histocytic infiltration um, uh, uh, into the bone marrow. Um, so longer Han cell histocytes that infiltrate into the bone marrow um, uh, and cause bone marrow suppression. And then you present with the petechial rash and the fever. So that's something else to uh, to consider as well. And longer Han cell histocytosis, uh, the histocytes can also infiltrate the skin and they can also present with eczema. Um, so our child also has eczema in this vignette. So that I think is, a, is an important consideration uh, um, uh, in this type of a, a child as well then. And while we're on that topic, uh, just kind of a brief aside, when you have a particular rash along with eczema, there's uh, three things that you have to really consider uh, on, that, on, that, on that patient, right? So uh, let's just put that here on the side here, just as a, a quick side teaching point. So particular rash uh, plus eczema. Um, there's three things that you have to consider, and I just mentioned one of them, the longer Hans cystitosis, right? Um, I was talking about that, and then uh, just above that, we have mentioned the, the, uh, uh, the Wiscott Aldrich uh, syndrome. Um, so, Wiscott Aldrich uh, uh, um, syndrome, um, uh, also known as WASP, um, that can also cause you to, uh, again, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, eczema and thrombocytopenia and the particular rash. Um, and then the third one that we mentioned earlier with the uh, herpes infection. So, uh, um, so basically, you have uh, um, eczema uh, herpeticum um, that can cause you to have uh, the particular rash along with eczema. Um, so uh, these three entities are, uh, are, are considerations when you have a particular rash and eczema, as our child actually does have a particular rash and eczema. So these are important considerations in our child, in addition to the rest of the differential diagnosis that uh, we've been talking about. So now let's uh, uh, go back to our child and uh, kind of put together everything and see if we can come up with what we think is the most likely diagnosis and how we're gonna, gonna work this out. Um, so this is the diagnosis, the differential the diagnosis um, of particular rash with fever. Uh, but then when we think about this child and some of the other presenting history and physical exam, there's a couple of important findings that we have by history and or exam. Uh, by history, we have uh, the fact that she's kind of clumsy, she's not really, uh, she doesn't want to walk, um, and that, uh, um, you know, she's been uh, kind of fatigued and not eating well and uh, having these these fevers. Um, and then uh, by history on exam, we also notice that she's having these uh, unusual eye movements, some abnormal uh, eye movements as well. Um, so when you put that all together, um, with the, especially with the abnormal eye movements um, and the clumsiness and not walking uh, and things. Um, when you put that all together based on this differential diagnosis, um, when you look at her closely and you look at her eyes, she's having these erratic eye movements. Um, and then she also, uh, on neuro exam, when we finally got her to walk, she did have a little bit of kind of ataxia and some central weakness uh, um, and some twitching of her extremities. <clears throat> um, so the eye findings, um, the erratic eye movements uh, were consistent with opsiclonus and then the uh, ataxia and the twitching of the uh, arms was consistent uh, with uh, myoclonus. So she actually uh, had uh, a, a kind of a paraneoplastic syndrome associated with neuroblastoma um, and she had something called opsiclonus myoclonus syndrome. Um, so she had opsiclonus myoclonus syndrome. Um, the so basically it's kind of dancing eyes and dancing feet uh, where you have erratic eye movements. Um, and then the myoclonus can be, uh, again, the, the twitching of the, of the extremities, but also you can have uh, central weakness and central ataxia. Um, so she was kind of clumsy and not walking well. Um, so putting it all together clinically, the thought was that she had opsiclonus myoclonus syndrome, which is a perineoplastic uh, uh, type of process related to, uh, to neuroblastoma. And it only occurs in maybe two to 5% of patients with neuroblastoma, um, uh, the opsiclonus myoclonus syndrome. Um, but when you have a patient with opsiclonus myoclonus syndrome, you have to rule out a neuroblastoma as the underlying cause of uh, those, those findings. Um, so uh, she uh, uh, underwent uh, uh, further studies and she basically got a, a CT of her abdomen and a CT of the chest and she did turn out to have uh, a neuroblastoma in her adrenal gland. Um, and other studies that you could do um, as you're uh, ruling out neuroblastoma, um, you could do uh, a, a scan called MIBG and uh, MIBG scan is 
It's basically a nuclear medicine scan uh, in which you have radioactive isotopes that are taken up by the neural crest cells. Um, and then they light up on the nuclear medicine scan and that can help you identify uh, a neuroblastoma. Um, or you could also do catecholamines uh, uh, levels, uh, especially in the urine. Uh, VMA and HVA can be measured. Um, and that could be uh, also uh, consistent with, uh, with a neuroblastoma. Um, so she ultimately uh, ended up having a diagnosis of neuroblastoma and she had bone marrow involvement. That's why she had the petechiae. Um, and, uh, and then she actually had the obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome, like I mentioned, is only uh, uh, seen in about two to 5% of patients with, with neuroblastoma. Um, and the patients with uh, obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome actually tend to do better as far as prognosis from the neuroblastoma because many times they are diagnosed uh, early um, uh, in their course of the malignancy because of the uh, um, oxyclonus and myoclonus that is noticed and then the neuroblastoma before um, it, it uh, spreads or metastasizes or gets too large is, uh, is actually investigated and found. So the prognosis is actually a bit better uh, from a treatment of neuroblastoma perspective. The treatment for the um, uh, uh, the thought is that the obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome is actually some sort of um, immunologic response to the neuroblastoma. Um, so the treatment is actually IVIG to help with uh, the uh, um, the perineoplastic uh, uh, manifestation. So giving IVIG can help with that. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times these these patients still go on to have uh, long term neurologic and developmental uh, issues related to their obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome, despite uh, being given uh, um, uh, IVIG. IG. Um, so our patient ended up having the, neuro the neuroblastoma, and I think this is a very interesting case um, uh, um, who, uh, on a child that presents with particular rash and fever, but also has other findings um, uh, where she's not walking and she's clumsy and she has the obstaclonus, and you put it all together and it turns out to have neuroblastoma. I think neuroblastoma is a very important consideration, especially in this age of a child, 18 months, 24 months, uh, for various uh, um, uh, 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 manifestations of their neuroblastoma um, because neuroblastoma can present with a large variety of ways um, uh, as, as we kind of alluded to uh, and it, um, you know with obstaclonus myoclonus syndrome the abdominal mass um, it can cause uh, posterior mediastinal masses and Horner syndrome as well um, it can also cause uh, chronic diarrhea because of uh, uh, catecholamine secretion it, cause, it can cause hypertension uh, as well uh, it can also uh, metastasize to the to around the eye in the orbits so you can have uh, proptosis. Um, so there's many, many different ways that neuroblastoma can present. And I think it's always something to always uh, think about in the back of your mind uh, when a child is presenting with some unusual type of symptoms because there's so many things um, that can be happening uh, that neuroblastoma can uh, be a presentation for. Um, so that's uh, um, the kind of summary of, uh, of this patient of this case. So I think it's very important to uh, uh, think about different causes of fatigue, rash, and fever. Uh, so hopefully this case was helpful um, as far as the clinical reasoning and the diagnostic uh, considerations for particular rash and fever. And now you can use this case to maybe read about some of these other entities uh, that maybe we kind of alluded to and to also read about uh, neuroblastoma as well. Um, so hopefully this uh, case was educational and beneficial. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in future crash cases as well.